welcome to the Pursuing Uncomfortable podcast. I'm really excited to not only interview you, but just to hang out with you. I feel like you raise my coolness factor at least 10%, maybe a lot more, probably a whole lot more. <laughs> It's really great to be here today. I always love talking about strength sports, and I always love talking about the mental fortitude that it takes to be physically strong. So I think this is going to be a, a perfect match. Yeah, today. and I think we're going to have a lot of fun talking about it. Your accomplishments. Oh, my gosh. I don't get to talk to people who rank nationally every day. Not only do you rank nationally, but you came in second in the nation. In the nation. That's a yep. ton yep. of people. Yep in a recent competition you're the second strongest woman yep. in the country yep it's, well now i, I want to be clear on my in my weight class right so super heavyweight weight class believe it or not there were some lighter lighter folks who had put up really big numbers as well so uh, i was humbled by that but yes second strongest super heavyweight strong woman uh, in the united states yep and i, I got my trophy and everything <gasps> can you Thank show you. it is it within reach can you put it for those Oh, no, it's down. It's downstairs. But I can show you. I can show you another one that I got because I won. Just a second. I won the. Uh, For those who are listening to the, the podcast, there's also a video edition of this on YouTube. So I haven't lost my mind and forgot that you all are listening to this. But there are folks who watch it on YouTube. And if you'd like to see what she's showing, hop over to YouTube. So, so we, in the strongman community, so there's, there's kind of a lot of different, different varieties and flavors of strength sports, right? Powerlifting, which is the three, the three lifts, right? Squat, deadlift, and bench. Um, you've got bodybuilding where people are really looking for that aesthetic performance, right? But strongman is kind of like, uh, meatheads picking up rocks in a field <laughs> and are like, it's like big, big people pick up big thing. And so, and so our trophies are reflective of that because this is a, this is the Warpath Skull Smash Strength Challenge. And it's got this, this very like refined looking uh, skull with the baseball bats right behind it. And so the primary sponsor for this was an ammonia, an ammonia company, because we will take a big hit of ammonia before we do a big lift to get our, our major muscle groups engaged. Um, so it's like, yeah, like Victorian era smelling salts that we that we eat. not even that's what they use and we just take a big a big torque of that and then and then our our primary motor, motor functions are engaged differently and we're able to lift more so okay. it's a amped up so anyway yes big people pick up big rocket field that's me <laughs> so thank you for showing us that and i have a picture of you with your medal and i will get that out there on social media too when this podcast airs so people can see that because it's really cool and you're so accomplished. So congratulations for that. I remember I had spoken to you a few days before that and you were just not really feeling it and almost didn't go. And then look what happened. You know, and I think that's a really great perspective for us to have on this podcast today, um, because one of my key messages with when it comes to the strongman activities is just show up. Just show up because most of the time, um, so so we talk about embracing embracing the challenge of trying to uh, of trying to show up to the gym all the time, and people talk about the motivation and the discipline, and all of this stuff. But when it comes down to it, successful people are the ones who go do the thing the most often, right? Um, and 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 I learned that by showing up at the national contest where I thought I was going to get my entire life handed to me. Like I was, I was going to come in last. Everybody was going to laugh. It was going to be a horrible experience. And I showed up and as the contest progressed, I noticed myself, like I'm looking, checking on my phone to see the standings. And all of a sudden I see myself on, on the podium. So if you, if you want to talk about a lesson in just showing up, even when you think you're probably not going to do well, you might as well just try. There's no harm. You might end up second place in the nation. That's <laughs> not a bad thing. Yeah. <laughs> Totally accidental. <laughs> yeah, because I had a really, I had a really difficult training cycle. You know, I had a lot of, I've had a lot of grief over the last year. I've, I've lost some key relationships in my life. My dog, who I'd had with me through some really challenging life events, passed away, and um, and my training, my training kind of co got compromised because of that. But I kept showing up as much as I could, and it turns out that was enough. So I think, I think, you know, what I learned from that is like not to beat myself up when things don't look exactly perfect in the gym. Um, and that's something that I can take into my career and into my friendships and into my everyday life too. It's like, you know, are you trying? Okay. Just keep trying. Love that lesson is applicable in so many aspects of life, but I know that the gym for you, the workouts for you, and this achievement for you is linked to 
those difficulties in your life that you just mentioned a little bit, but can you tell us how you got started on this path? Yeah, a lot of people look at this and they say, well, gosh, well, how in the world would you possibly get into picking up, you know, five, 600 pounds and walking around with it? And because it's not, a, it's not a typical, a typical hobby, right? Um, and that's legitimate. So I've always been someone who went to the gym. So my parents, my parents got me started in weightlifting when I was, you know, 12 or 13 to prepare for sports. We lived on a military base. And so like, that was really, that was really a part of my life forever and ever. I kind of got away from it. And then I decided um, in 2018 that it was time for me to get sober because I had been making a lot of really uh, questionable life decisions. <laughs> and and uh, I ended up kind of on the verge of homelessness at one point. And um, I said, you know, I think the, I think the booze has got to go. And so I started working with a trainer uh, at a local gym just to start getting that foundation built and say like, okay, you know, I want to maybe feel better, get a little healthier, get some of this like ick out. Because when you get sober, your whole body just feels like a coiled spring that is, that can't release you know, and, and so, so where did I find a lot of those happy chemicals for my brain is, is really in these intense workouts. And then through meeting that first trainer who was, who was, you know, one of these big hardcore meathead guys, he's like, Hey, have you ever considered competing? And I said, well, not really. I mean, that's, that's okay. And he's like, you need to compete. So I found a, um, an all women's strongman competition in Baltimore, Maryland at a gym called five by three, five X three out in, out in Baltimore. And I went to this all women's show and it was like, 150 women all celebrating their strength. And I was hooked. So I got on the, I got second place in my first novice competition. Um, I trained for about seven or eight months for that event, had a, an absolute blast. I'm still friends with a lot of the folks that I met there. And, uh, from there, from there, I continued on, um, in my strength career and have, have since earned, uh, Utah's strongest woman in 2020, um, you know, took first place at the skull smash challenge and have, have, uh, held, accomplished, uh, two world records in the sport of grip grip sport. Um, so yeah, so it's just a virtuous, that virtuous cycle got started. I stopped drinking and I've been sober for uh, about four well, and a half years Congratulations on your sobriety. Thank you. So you mentioned grip strength and grip sport. Can you tell us a little bit what that is? Again, another thing I fell into entirely accidentally because my uh, the gym where I train actually uh, is is elite in the sport in grip sport, and it turns out that I just happened to show up at this place that has this this kind of cohort of really strong handed people. Um, so when we think about grip sport, you know, I've got these little rubber things that I'm always uh, fidgeting with at my at my desk. Um, but grip sport is just picking up oddly shaped objects. Like obviously you use your hands for almost everything in weightlifting, right? But this is specific to like arm and like forearm and grip strength. So we'll pick up like a square deadlift bar. So instead of picking, you know, it's usually round and you kind of curl your hand around it this way. But when you're, when you're doing the square one, it's kind of like four inches by three inches and, and it makes it a lot harder to pick up. Um, so at my gym, I think we've got 15 or 17 world records between the five or 10 of us that compete in this discipline. Um, and there's actually for the three inch by four inch Saxon bar, we hold the world record here in Carbondale, Colorado, uh, for every gender and weight class. So, uh, just a very accomplished group of folks who kind of specialize in this. My roommate who I, I go to the gym with, uh, he has the, he has the the same focus in his everyday life. Like he's really into the grip sport. And so uh, I said, well, this seems like a lot of fun. So I got involved and who knew two world records later, here we are. <laughs> my dad, my dad grew up on a, on a farm and he had to milk the cows every morning. And I remember as a kid, when my dad grabbed my arm, there was no wrenching free. There was no getting out of that. So when you say grip strength, that's what my mind goes back to. <laughs> Yeah, well, and a lot of these things, you know, have their roots in in what did we used to do as human beings, and and I think that that's, you know, in our modern society, and I'm not going to pontificate on this too much, but I think there's a lot of value in in challenging yourself to do really difficult physical things that our ancestors knew, like they had to do that stuff to survive, right? And that's part of our it's part of our makeup, and it's part of our blood, and it's part of what makes our bodies and our brains feel really good is like overcoming these sincere physical challenges. And so once I started, once I started putting that time and effort into the gym to do something that I never thought I would do, all of a sudden that started translating into my everyday life as well. And so so yeah, I understand that. But I can crush an egg. Like I can crush an egg. Uh, <laughs> I do all the funny like feats of strength, right? You know, like crushing the the thing with your biceps or like all the TikTok stuff. That's that sounds like a blast. <laughs>
Yeah. So you really hit on the sweet <laughs> spot of what this podcast is all about, leaning into the difficult, leaning into the uncomfortable so that you can overcome it. And there's so much connection between body, mind, and spirit. I actually think they are the same thing. The matter and the energy that have melded together, we are embodied spirits. When we lean into something difficult emotionally, we engage our, the strength of our bodies. We feel it in our bodies. When we do something physical, like you've described, there are emotional and spiritual rewards that come from that as well. So I applaud you for all the work you have done and the link between using your physical body and strength to improve your, to have sobriety and to continually seek those things. They do go together and you've really found something profound in what you do. And the, I mean, even the name of your podcast really resonated with me, which is why I'm really glad to be here is because in the strongman community, we have a lot of folks that co that are old military guys, like veterans who, who still stay in their physical, you know, their physical activity regimens and whatnot. And, and, uh, you know, pursuing uncomfortable is an awful lot like the old military saying of embrace mm -hmm. the suck. <laughs> and, and to your point, we talk a lot about how, like, I have found this, this very, very tangible analogy. We have this big stone that we carry in front of us called the Husafel stone that looks like a, like a coffin kind of, um, and you wrap your arms around it and you walk with it or you run with it. Um, and, and it's loaded with weight. And usually the weights that I carry are about 200 to 250 pounds in this thing in front of me. And I'll tell you, so, so like, it's, it's like a big slippery metal implement that's easy to drop. It, like it's, it requires a great deal of, of discipline to really Really dig into it and hold it close. When we talk about embrace the suck, when it comes to the Husevel stone, that's a, that's an actual like, em, like actually embrace it physically. Because the closer you can get to that, the more surface area of your body that is in contact with this with this particular implement, the farther you're going to be able to carry it, the faster you're going to be able to go, the more weight you're going to be able to lift. It's the same thing with deadlifting. It's the same with any you know bench pressing. Any of these movements that require us to move a, a significant amount of weight, the closer we can get physically to the hard thing, the more leverage we have to complete it. And so, so I think it's really important to note that the reason I drank and the reason I you know ran out and did a bunch of drugs and do all this other stuff it was because I was trying to escape from the problem. But once I started being brave enough to look at it, even just a little bit, just a peek at the corner, right? Like I didn't have to tackle the whole problem, just like a little bit of it. Once I started being brave enough to embrace that little bit, now all of a sudden I've got the physical strength to dig in. And now all of a sudden I've got the mental strength to dig in. And that's where that pursuing uncomfortable and that embracing the suck really, really has uh, applicability, not only in strength sports, but in your yeah, everyday life. You're, yes, we like to distance ourselves from our emotions. And that creates problems, but embracing them, getting up close, getting all, all next to them is where the, where the growth happens. I love that. And now I'm going to have this image of embracing it and holding it close to me. And the more I can get into contact with those things, whether it's emotions or a physical problem or, or whatever kind of challenge, the better my odds of overcoming it will be. Thank you. Yeah, well, and, and all these things, it's like I say, it's absolutely awful to do that the first time. Like my first year of sobriety, I've got some art that I made um, during that first year of sobriety. So, and it just looks really like, like everything, everything just felt like an assault to my senses, right? Like the world felt painful, like clothing was gross feeling, right? Like itchy. And I was like, oh, everything felt, everything felt awful. And so, so what was really important for me there was building up the community to continue to say, hey, push through and get to the good part, push through and get to the good part. Because I was working like part-time for, you know, peanuts at this, at a psychiatric hospital doing art and activities. And then I, I like 10 X my income in the last five years and I've started three companies. Um, I, again, all of this stuff because I, because I got sober and because I started staring things in the face and I did the 10 step or 12 steps, 10 steps. I did the 12 steps. Uh, like I worked through all that, right? I, 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 that works for everybody, not, or for some people, not for everybody, but, um, I, I developed the discipline to like, look at the things really hard. And it is like, I will tell you, it's not fun. I'm not like, Oh yay. Let me embrace all my grief. Like it's horrible. <laughs> it's horrible. It's but, but it, but it, 
oh, it's, it's miserable. It's miserable and it's exhausting, right? But the keys there are community. Like you've got to have a community and you've just got to understand that you can't perform at, at top speed every single day. You just, again, you just show up. What is yeah. possible for you now that wasn't possible for you before? Oh, you know, just basic life functions. I used to let my bank account get down to zero or because I was too afraid to look at my, my spending. Right. Or, um, I, I couldn't maintain strong relationships because I would just leave at the first sight of a problem. Um, I would never like stare at the thing, like sit there with someone I cared about and loved and be like, Hey, let's work through this together. Right. Um, I, I think being less reactive has allowed me to, to build up discipline, to get the things that I want in my life. Um, so like I've been able to purchase a home, which I never, ever thought that I would be able to purchase a home. And now I've got, I'm able to provide a room for, uh, you know, somebody, somebody else in my community who might need a place to stay at a good price. Right. Um, and, and so I think, I think what's possible for me now is being able also to see mm. a future because I hit 25 and I thought, why am I still here? Like, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, and I, I, at my 25th birthday, I had a, I had a whole like speech <laughs> for my friends where I was like, I did, I made it, I made it to 25, but I didn't have a plan past that because I really thought I wouldn't be here anymore. Um, so being able to envision a future, you know, I'm 37 now I'm 37. I'm at the top of the age range for this, for this national contest. It's masters, masters starts at 40. So I'm at the top of the age range and I'm still kicking butt and taking names. So, um, what's possible now? I, I guess I don't know what's next, but I can, but I, but I'm willing to stick around to find out. And I think yeah, that's and another difference. question might be what's impossible. And I'm guessing that's going to be a really short list. I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know. I started like, I just recently, we just launched our new business, me and my business partner up in Canada. We just launched our business this week. Oh, um, already we are. You thank you. It's something we've been working on for four years and we finally, finally got out there and made it happen. And we have already been experiencing so much success there. And it's terrifying. Don't get me wrong. I'm, it's absolutely terrifying. Um, but again, I got a buddy who's in it with me and, and we're making it happen. Um, what's impossible. I, I, I listen, anything's possible as long as I don't drink. Yeah. My, my, my one responsibility every single day is don't pick up a drink, no matter what. Don't pick up a drink, no matter what. Don't pick up a drink, no matter what. Doesn't matter. Any, anything, anything. If I just sit in my house all day and do nothing, but I stayed sober, that's a success. So yeah, that's a great question. I don't know what's impossible. I guess we'll find out when I, when I hit a you wall. Know, <laughs> looking into things, maybe nothing is impossible. I mean, waking up and living on the moon. Okay, let's not be silly, but the things that you can accomplish and overcome in your life really that list of impossible starts to shrink when you lean into the difficult things. Well, and I think it's, I'm going to be honest with you, Melissa, one of the most difficult things that I've been facing over the last year is um, being able to accept the fact that I might get everything that I want mm. in life. Um, because so many, for so many years, I have been afraid and nervous and freaked out about, oh my gosh, I just need to make my basic needs. You know, I've been on food stamps. I've, it's not like, it's not like this is, things have been easy, right? I've been, I've been struggling for a lot of years and now I'm sitting here going, you know, I've got great friendships. I've got this business endeavor that I'm looking towards. I'm a nationally ranked strength athlete. Like this is everything I've ever wanted. Um, and I'm allowed to have it and it's okay you know, I'm allowed to like rest in this and I'm allowed to be grateful. And, but, but I think what comes down with that is that you have to put your hand out to bring other people up the yeah. ladder. So there's a responsibility that comes along when you achieve a certain measure of, of, you know, when you get to that successful place, what do I do next is I put out my hand and help other people climb up the That's same way. That's beautiful. I That's beautiful. I hope you're also taking the time to enjoy it because you do deserve to enjoy it too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, every day that I go to the gym is a blessing. Uh, I get to move my body. It's healthy. You know, I'm not injured right now. Um, I, I, I get to, I just, I get to do everything that I want when I wake up in the day right now. And so I'm the, the gratitude that I have is, uh, is overwhelming, but I do want to say also, this has been, you know, five years of work to put, so it doesn't happen overnight, but again, every single little step that you take to get to wherever it is that you want to go is a worthwhile absolutely. step. Keep showing up. 
keep keep showing up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even if it feels terrible, and it's going to feel terrible sometimes, but that doesn't mean you're doing yeah. anything wrong. Sometimes you just feel terrible, you know, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Catherine, I love your success because you aren't in the mold of a person we would create to be successful. I mean, you've had a lot of setbacks. You've had a lot of challenges. You've struggled with alcoholism. You have ADHD. You have things that people wouldn't necessarily say, oh, that's not the profile for a successful person. But you did it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And, you know, I do it in an industry. So I'm in, I'm in a RFP sales is my, is my business. So like proposal management, which is traditionally a very stoic institutional okay. kind of like buttoned up, you know, very, yeah. And, and, and I come know in what here. That means. So can you clarify <laughs> for us what you're talking about? It's just, it's like government. It's like selling oh, to the government. Okay. Right. So like, how do we sell, how do we sell medical supplies or, um, uh, plumbing, services or, you know, whatever, whatever's coming along that small government, like local government or national government might need, we put together a document and then they, then they decide. Right. But it's, it's a bunch of engineers and a bunch of attorneys and a bunch of like construction people. And like this, this really, um, this really conservative industry and, and everyone says, don't dye your hair the color that it is. And people who are on the podcast right now, my hair is like lime green. Um, I've got a full sleeve of tattoos while I'm working on getting this one filled in. Cause that's, that's the next spot, but I've got almost a full sleeve of tattoos. Right. Um, and I show up and everyone says, Oh, you'll never be able to make it in this industry with the way you look. And I just I don't even care. I just show up and I, I'm my true self. And I'll tell you what, we're building a strong community of people who are just like, like, we're all just like each other and we're changing the way the industry works. So I, I, I say that being your authentic self is a huge risk. It's it, that's also really scary and it's worth it. Absolutely. So, yeah, Absolutely. Just keep working and you know, I'm a pastor. I've served churches for mm -hmm. 25 years. I do prison or jail ministry. I'm, there's a big difference between a jail and a prison. And I do yeah. ministries there. And the thing that I keep coming in contact with wherever I do ministry, whether it's in the jail, whether it's in the local congregation or online or what have you, the one thing that people battle with most is they are beloved just as they are. You have value, you have all, you have love, just who you are. And it's pretty cool. And the folks that really suffer in life that have, that every single woman that I've met in jail has been told and believed that they are worthless. And changing that one truth, that one understanding about ourselves, that we have value, we matter, and we are loved, even if we don't fit some kind of idealized model or form or profile, that is a game changer yeah. in life. How have you seen that? Like, I'm really curious how you've seen people change once they really internalize that message. Well, it's a lot of what you've said, that the stake that they put in other folks' opinions tends to, not overnight, in some cases it does overnight, but it slowly wanes until it's a growth process and some grow fast, some grow slowly. Uh, folks who have hold, held grudges for a long time and have held on to all of those negative feelings who are able to forget themselves and to forgive others and let those grudges go, so much stuff that they've been holding on to in life falls away. Weight will fall away. Uh, resentments fall away. Resistance falls away. And so much more is available to them in life. Uh, I've seen it in people who want to go to school, want to go to college, but didn't think they were college material or worthy of having a career in a profession and just kept showing up and kept doing it. And they found that they do have value and that people value their value. So in a lot of different ways, mm -hmm. thank you for asking that. Yeah, no, I think our society teaches us and particularly women, you know, or, or non-men, uh, if we don't fall into a certain, if we, if we aren't caretakers or if we don't have this certain kind of approach to our life, we're made to feel guilty about the parts of ourselves that we, you know, that we put forward. And I, I will tell you, I will tell you that working the 12 steps saved my life because, um, it helped me understand 
that the things that I viewed as absolutely terrible that I had done in the past, I'm like, make no mistake. I've done a lot of really questionable stuff. Um, but, but I heard other people talking about those same things and how they were able to move past it and instead make a positive life for themselves afterwards while integrating the lessons that they had learned when they were younger. And I thought, you know, I can, I can either be held back by the really unfortunate things that I did in my past, or I can acknowledge that that person was trying to survive and was trying to like make the best of the situation and love her through it. And now I'm, you know, now I'm older and I'm going to make better choices. Um, but a lot, you know, I'm, I feel like I have to get this message out there and talk about this type of stuff because there are a lot of people who don't live through the, the bad choices that I lived through. Um, and so, so how do we make sure that other folks, you know, know what resources are available to them, whether it be 12 step community, whether it be, you know, halfway house or like a, or like a sober living type situation, or even just some of these online sobriety resources. Um, but you, you know, folks, folks who are struggling with that, there are so many resources today. And if, and if you want to stop drinking, you can. Um, so if people like me are, are here to help. So. Thank you for okay. that. Because when, Everyone has a story about themselves that they don't ever want anyone else to know about them. And when you're able to mm -hmm. really look at that story of yourself, to really see the whole context and the perspective of yourself, there was something there that was edifying you in a way that no other part of life was. And don't punish yourself for that. Your person at that age and in that context and in that circumstance, they got you to this point today. Don't punish them. Don't be ashamed yep. of them. Thank them. Thank them for surviving that time. Thank them for growing into this person and allow them to rest because you got the wheel now. And yeah, resources. Yep. Yep. There are resources. And I do have a blog that goes along with the podcast. And I want people to comment mm -hmm. right on this episode. I want people to comment where their struggles are, what resources they need. I want people listening to this, ask Catherine for advice and for wisdom and for resources. And I know she will answer and be responsive to that and help you find a direction in life. You know, I'll show up too and offer what I can offer, but the link to that blog site is going to be in the show notes. So make sure that you click that. I want to hear your responses to Catherine's story. I want to hear your struggles and I want to see the questions you have. And I know Catherine does too. Yeah. And the great thing about, you know, the great thing when we think about sobriety is that there's instant, there's an instant sense of validation because if you've been sober for one day, you know a little bit more about sobriety than the person who's been who's not been sober for a day right so so we as a community of people reach out our hands to whoever's climbing up behind us um and and i think that's where some of that understanding of our value comes in because we have a, a not only a responsibility but also the joy of being able to watch other people develop as they as they follow along the, these paths as well um and, and, and I think that's the power of making amends too, because making amends isn't just apologizing. It's, it's setting things right that you've done in your past. And again, whether you do this in the context of a, a, a 12 step program, or if you do it in, on your own time, uh, making amends is one of the more powerful activities that I've ever done because it's saying, okay, you know, I'm going to make right the things that I've done in my life that, that didn't live up to how I should have behaved. Oh my right? gosh. And I, and I can You're continue to launch do that me today, into this whole so scary. So jack wrong, now I'm going to be talking like, for another hey, three and a half I, hours I on this. Part. Right. Do I need, do you need money? Do you need, do you need resources? Like, do you need me to apologize? Do you need me to like do some service for you? Like what's going to set this right for us to be okay again? Um, yeah. And that's been a really, that's been a really powerful lesson too. So you're, I love this concept of like how everybody having inherent value and how this conversation has turned to that direction. Yeah. Because listen, whether if I get my, if I get my butt handed to me at national contest, I'm still somebody who is just as valuable as somebody who wins first Absolutely. place. It's, it's just the fact that I can. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the person who finished first place, isn't going to be able to reach out and help the people that you are able to reach out and help along the way. You know what? I just flashed back to yeah. when I was a kid uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer would come on every year. It still does. My kid watches it. But when I was a little kid watching that show, you know, my emotions were all over the place as a kid. And I was terrified by the abominable snowman. I was just distraught and sobbing over their plight with the elf and 
Rudolph and how the communities just cast him out and it was so wrong. But the thing I loved the most about that show was the island of the misfit toys. It's like, oh my gosh, is that heaven? Because they were at the North Pole. But as a kid, maybe that was what heaven was. That place where everybody could fit in and find their place. And at the end of the show, it showed where each of those toys on the island of the misfit toys found the right kid that needed them. So that's always been a part of my psyche and makeup is that, yeah, those of us who might be labeled misfits were special fits for those who can't, who need more than the average. Yeah. And if people tell you you're too much, then go yeah, find different they're people. They're not your people. Like people will tell me, they'll be like, Hey, you're lifting too much weight. And I'm like, you, your opinion mm -hmm. about this doesn't matter. You know, because yeah, I am doing, a, I'm doing way more than you can maybe, or maybe I'm doing way more than you want to, or I'm doing something that scares you, but it doesn't mm -hmm. scare me. And so I like, like to that point, if someone tells you you're too much, if someone tells you all these things about yourself, don't immediately believe someone who criticizes you like that. Like, uh, <laughs> it's okay to be a lot. It's okay to have a ton of energy. It's okay to be somebody who's kind of like all over the place and trying to figure out what you want to do. Like, I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. I'm an author. I'm a strong person. Like I am, I am a business owner, but like, what do I want to do when I grow up? It's, we're still discovering that. So, um, so yeah, don't believe, don't believe people when they say you're too much, if then, then they can go find less. Yeah, in my those opinion. comments are a lot more, <laughs> say a lot more about them than they do about you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, okay. So, so are we, are we reaching yeah. towards the end of our, the end of our experience today? Can, yeah, can I pitch Catherine, my book? I would love to hear more about your book. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I just, I have it sitting right here, which is why I'm super excited. Um, so, so I wrote a book, it's called Productive Pain. My life as a strong woman. Uh, it's designed with a few, just little short chapters, um, about, about 20 short chapters, three to five pages. I designed it this way because when I was in early sobriety, I was struggling to be able to read anything longer than just a few paragraphs. And so this is a like neurodivergent frame neurodivergent brain friendly book that's designed to help you learn a few lessons, got some, some memoir items in there of mine that you can learn a little bit about my own history, uh, learn how to become your authentic self and, uh, and learn how to achieve the goals that you want with it really, really snappy and quick read. So you, you don't have to dedicate a ton of time to getting through it. You can learn a lot of great lessons available at warmadenfitness.com. Um, and if you use the code WARPAINT, you can get a, uh, that's all, all capital, W-A-R-P-A-I-N-T. I can give you a special discount on the book. Uh, so I go over there. I have pre-ordered and I'm impatiently, I mean, patiently waiting for it to come to my <laughs> box. So um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. The link to this book is in the show notes. The coupon code, the war paint is also in the show notes. So make sure you check this out because I can't wait to read this book. Knowing Catherine and hearing her stories and just the interactions we've had, I really can't wait for this book. It's, I'm a, it's one of those things where my family is going to have to fend for themselves until I get through this book. I'm going to just cocoon myself. The world can wait. I want to read it cover to cover. I appreciate you. And you know, you know, it's funny because this is the first book that I've ever written. Um, and I did it in 10 days mm -hmm. as one does. Um, a lot of people say, oh, you've got it. And this is again, just another example of like, do, do you don't let other people tell you, tell you what works best for you. Um, because I sat down, I sat down uh, over a 10 day stretch in November and just wrote the whole thing. Um, and, and, uh, to be able to experience that and to be able to just get this into the right people's hands, uh, especially, especially, especially for women who are looking to build their own physical and emotional strength. No, no reason scared of picking up heavy weight, whether that's personal weight, whether that's physical weight in the gym, like you're strong enough, you can do it. Don't be afraid. Perfect. Thank you, Catherine. And we look forward to seeing where life takes you in the future. And maybe someday we'll come back and get an update. Thank you, Melissa. I appreciate you. This has been a blast.